Testing, testing. Yep. Good. We're good. And oh, there we go. Are we good? Okay. Michael. Oh yeah. I don't know if uh, there's if you ever entertain us with anything in, uh, like uh, maybe an, inter an interesting note about the oboe, or I don't know. I think a lot of us, myself included, don't know anything about the oboe. Yeah. If it would ever, I don't know. If there's anything interesting about it, or how long you've been playing, or something like that. Okay. Um, would you be comfortable sharing something and an interesting tidbit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I did want to ask Pastor Michael on um, breathe on the uh, the prayer hymn. Um, it's pretty short, but there are four verses. Did you want us to sing all four, or we were thinking because it's the prayer hymn, usually that's a little short. If you want us yeah. to do the last verse and last, or if you want us to do all four, it's pretty short. It's only like two lines. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think let's just go ahead and sing the whole thing. Okay. Okay.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. They're a little sleep. Let's do that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. To Aaron, he's our liturgist this morning. It's great to see each and every one of you on this summer day. Thanks. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. Uh, to recognize Juneteenth, uh, Charles is going to be performing songs to celebrate the spirit of the holiday. Of course, if you weren't aware, this is the day the 13th Amendment was passed, ending slavery in the United States. Um, we can also, uh, would love you to join the Reconciling Ministries and become a member of that. Uh, the Reconciling Ministries here at Avondale works to develop connections among the LGBTQIA plus community and its many allies. Uh, take a moment to talk with Bonnie House, our Reconciling Ministry leaders, or Gwen Roberts, who I'm familiar with, about joining us. Great, Aaron, thank you. Lots, uh, lots to stay connected with uh, in the life of our church, for example, Make sure that you are receiving our weekly email or our mailings every week. Our email, ha I usually send it out on Thursday, and it has a, um, it usually has the, the bulletin, uh, it has the monthly newsletter, it has, uh, so you've got, in that you've got the, the prayer list, all the activities going on. If you check our website a lot, there's a, a calendar of events, of things that's going on. So if you aren't receiving that information or don't know how to access it, let me know and we'll get you connected um, so that you know exactly what's going on almost to the day. Also, you can receive text messages or emails for prayer concerns, so uh, make sure you're on that list as well. As we come to God this morning, again, I just want to welcome those who are uh, joining us on our virtual worship service or on our on-demand service throughout the week. We're very glad to have you worshiping with us, and I hope that you will leave us a comment or a prayer concern or a joy and let us know what's going on wherever you are. Uh, let us pray. Our loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and for your Holy Spirit that is with each one of us. Send it upon us, O Lord, we pray, in this season of Pentecost. Fill our hearts with your love and this place with your wisdom that we may go forth into the world, being the disciples and the church you call us to be. This we pray in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us worship. Please join me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin and on screen. When we long for the special effects we think life should offer, it is enough for us that God comes in a soft summer shower. When our hearts are cracked by the drought of doubt, it is enough for us that God opens up the fountains of faith for us. When our senses are deadened by the sales pitches of our culture, it is enough for us that God wraps us in the silence of grace. Let's stand together and sing God of Love and God of Power, a good hymn of the Holy Spirit. God of Love and God of Power, grant in us this burning hour grace to ask these gifts of thee daring hearts and spirits free god of love and god of power 
thou hast called us for this hour. God, we are the first to be banished by our fears from thee. Give us courage, let us hear heaven's trumpets ringing clear. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. All our lives belong to thee, thou art finely loyalty. Slaves are we whene'er we share that devotion anywhere. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. God of love and God of power, make us worthy of this hour. Our three lives, if it's thy will, keep being free, our spirit still. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. And please be seated. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they arrived at the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on shore, a man from the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had not worn any clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, shouting, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back to the abyss. Now there on the hillside a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let him enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd stampeded down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found that the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it told him how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then the whole throng of people of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, and they were seized with great fear. So he got in the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of God for the people of God. In both of our scriptures today, it talks about how we're ordered to, you know, we see what God has done and we're called to return home and declare how much God has done for us. Our unison prayer today is on the screen and let us join our voices together in that prayer. O oh God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O oh Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us in the midst of the storm. O oh still, small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world. We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea, Amen. Our response today to this prayer is, O oh God, our help in ages past, and we'll sing verses 1 and 6. Be thou our guide. 
died while life shall last and all the eternal home. I've asked Sean today to uh, give us an interesting tidbit about the oboe. We've been blessed in the past several weeks because of Sean's uh, gift and expertise with the instrument. But I don't know much about it, and I'm sure many of us don't either. And so, again, I've asked Sean to tell us something interesting about the instruments so that we might appreciate it more. Hello. Um, so, lots of people always ask me, oh, that's a funny-looking clarinet. And it does kind of look like a clarinet, but um, the most unique feature of the oboe is um, this little tiny piece of wood up here. That's the reed. And... Um, it's called a double reed because there are two pieces, and on clarinet, saxophone, they only have one reed, so those are single reed instruments. Um, and I actually make these things, and almost every oboist you meet um, is going to make these. And throughout college, and even now, probably for every hour that I spend practicing and actually making noise with this thing, I'm spending two or more hours working on reeds. So it's a oh, whole process and aspect of the instrument, I had no idea what I was getting into when I, you know, in fifth grade picked to play the oboe. So if I could go back in time, I might pick something like drums where I wouldn't have to spend so much time uh, woodworking as opposed to music making. But um, I've learned to love doing it, and um, yeah, it's just uh, a necessary part of the instrument that not a lot of people know about. And... Um, once again, I was a little tardy in getting my music selection to Pastor Michael, so that's two weeks in a row, but I'm going to get it next time. Um, so this morning, Charles and I are going to be um, performing an excerpt from Mozart's oboe concerto in C major. We'll be playing um, part of the second movement, and um, we're just sharing things about the oboe and the piece today. Um, one thing you'll hear is Charles is going to hit a big um, one six four chord. That's kind of music theory nerd talk. Yep, you're going to hear this chord, and then I'm going to start playing a bunch of stuff by myself, and that's called a cadenza. And um, in Mozart's time, in a lot of concertos, that was just an opportunity for the soloist to kind of show off their stuff. And Mozart didn't write anything. It was kind of um, incumbent on the performer to write something. So this is a cadenza that I wrote years and years ago because I've been playing this piece as long as I've been playing the oboe and um, I've always liked what I wrote and so I thought why reinvent the wheel? I'm just gonna keep on playing it.
Great to have our gifted musicians with us uh, today. I also want to thank our tech team back in the back. We've got Jason and Brent back there. Thank you for your work this morning and making sure that uh, people can watch us from wherever they are. We have a time for our children to come forward and have story time together with me. So are there kids among us today? I know there was earlier. Kids, come on up and let's sing Jesus Loves the Little Children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every shade from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Spread out. Today we are going to read one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. And when I was a kid, we used to sing this song. It was Zacchaeus was a wee little man and he climbed up in a sycamore tree because he wanted to see Jesus. Have you ever been anywhere in a crowd and you couldn't see what was going on? Maybe you got up on your dad's back, his shoulders, or maybe somebody lifted you up or you had to stand up somewhere where you could see it. Does that sound like that's happened before? Yeah. Well, that's what happened to Zacchaeus and we've got more coming right up. So, here's the story. So many people wanted to see Jesus. After all, he healed diseases, he gave blind men sight, and he brought dead people back to life. And what did we talk about today, Joseph? What did Jesus do? He walked on water. Yes. Jesus was doing awesome things. Well... Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, was he tall? He was a small guy, yeah. And Zacchaeus could not see over the heads of the crowds. He couldn't count on anyone to lift him up either because Zacchaeus, well, he didn't have any friends with him there. We're so happy today. (laughs) We love that. (laughs) That's awesome. So Zacchaeus was not popular. He was a tax collector. Tax collectors were not popular. Everybody was mad at them because they took money and they took some for themselves. They were what we might call crooked or they were not honest. They were deceptive. They scammed people. And they tricked them. All those words. That's what they did. They often took people's money unfairly. If Zacchaeus was going to see Jesus, he was going to have to climb a tree. He was going to have to climb a tree. That was his only thing. Jesus knew that Zacchaeus had no friends. He knew that Zacchaeus was up in that tree, stopping underneath the tree. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus stopped underneath the tree. He looked up and he said, come down, Zacchaeus. I'm staying at your house today. Now, that's really something. What what would you do if Jesus came to your house? I know I'd have to pick up a bunch of dirty clothes. I'd probably have to clean the sink. Then he'd just like, hey, I'm coming to your house today. He said, I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus was like, what? And everybody else was mad because Jesus didn't go to some honest person's house, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, who didn't have any friends. He was the guy that scammed. Yet Jesus was like, I'm coming to your house today. And they said, you know, Zacchaeus was a little man, and, and that, they said, that little man is a sinner if there was ever one. They were not happy. Zacchaeus didn't often obey God. He was a sinner. Yet later at the house, Zacchaeus told Jesus he was sorry for cheating people. Zacchaeus said he was sorry and that he would make it up by returning all the money that he had stolen. Because Jesus came to his house, he was like, you know what? I'm going to be on my best behavior from now on. I'm going to change my life. I'm not going to be a sinner anymore. He loved Jesus that much. Wonderful, Jesus said. Now instead of being punished by God, you will live with me in heaven. Zacchaeus was no longer a sinner. He was no longer a cheat. He changed his life. And finally, Zacchaeus had a friend, the best friend of all. And who's that? Jesus. Jesus. 
We've been talking about how Jesus is our best friend in Sunday school, and Jesus wants us to be a best friend to others. Just like Jesus is a friend to Zacchaeus, even though, you know, he, he had some mess-ups in his life. He had some things that he needed to be sorry about, and he was. Um, and I think the same way for us. Jesus wants to be our friend, and Jesus wants us to be a friend to others. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you're at or what you've done. All you got to say is, Jesus, I'm sorry, or tell your friend you're sorry, or whatever. And, and Jesus is, loves you, and he cares for you always, no matter what. Well, guys, thank you for coming up to listen to story and also having a great Sunday school. But we're not yet done yet. Joseph, we got to pray. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads and repeat after me, and the church is going to help us. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank you for loving us. Help us to always welcome you like Zacchaeus did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. That's what I should have said. I should have prayed and then said thank you for coming up today. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week. of the world every shade from dark to light all are precious in his sight jesus loves the little children of the world great to have the kids up today love to hear those happy happy voices in in our time of worship today we offer our joys and our concerns up to god uh, to god And there is a lot going on in our lives, um, and there are so many things for which we are grateful, and so many burdens that we are also bearing as we worship him. And so this is what this time of worship is about, giving ourselves, giving our whole burden, giving our our distractions and our joys um, back to God. And so on the back of the tear-off form, there's a place where you can put your joys and concerns. If they are just for me, uh, make sure that you mark that so I know what's appropriate to put out on our public prayer list. In this time, let us open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to God in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we are so thankful for your love and your grace. And we thank you that you are Abba, our Father. God, today we lift up to you all these uh, joys that we share. We're thankful for the joy of our children and for your spirit that is in this place. But God, today we also pray for those who are struggling, those that we love and know that are going through pains uh, and recovery, treatments and procedure. And for those uh, among us that are struggling with pains that aren't so much physical, but they're of the soul. God, you know our griefs, you know our joys, you know who we are, you know us through and through. And we're bold enough to ask that once more, just once more, you'll come into our hearts. Where there is anger, bring us happiness. Where there is hurt, bring us healing. Where there is hate, so love. And where there is sin, reconcile us to you and to one another, we pray. God, we know that you love us so much that you came into this world in the form of your son, our savior, Jesus, who taught us and loved us and showed us what it means to love you and others with all our hearts and how that is the greatest gift. Jesus, when you, were, when you suffered and died and were put on the cross and died for our sin, that was not the end of the story. Because you were taken down and put into the tomb. And after three days, you rose to give God glory and to assure us that there is truly nothing in our world, nothing in our lives that is ever too great for God or us to handle together. God, in this moment, we pray in the method of silent prayer, lifting up our hearts to you, 
Hear our prayers, know our joys, celebrate with us, and lift us up where we need it, O God, we pray. Speak to us once more your gentle whisper to sustain us, we pray. God, we look around and we see so much noise. But Lord, help us to remember that many times you aren't in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. It is in your gentle whisper. Help us to hear it in this world of noise. Help us to hear your calm, gentle, still, small voice speaking to us assurance, hope, and love. We pray all this in the name of the one who has saved us, Jesus. And we pray together the prayer that he taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing together our prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God. by the Holy Spirit, it shows, and it permeates in every part of our lives, in how and what we speak, in how we budget uh, our time and our money. It, uh, it, it shows in, in who we spend time with and how we spend our time, all sorts of things. And I'm grateful for all that is done in the name of Christ throughout the week. Everyone here has a, has a, a gift and has gifts that you are using uh, to further the kingdom, and I'm so very thankful for that. I'm also grateful for the gifts of financial resources that comes from you, and it's the reason why we're able to be here and sustain this building and be a ministry of presence in this community. 
Thank you. And so as the ushers come forward, I encourage you to give as God is calling you. On the back of the, on the tear-off form, there's uh, many ways that you may have served throughout the week. But really, just by being here is a ministry. Just your being present. In fact, one of the ways that we as United Methodists believe that we offer to God ourselves is through our presence. And so thank you for being here. And as you tear off that form, and basically it's a way to say, Lord, here I am, use me. When we're eager, when we're seeking, when we listen for that still small voice of God, he speaks and fulfills us. Let us give as God is calling us to. Let's stand together and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts, praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Holy God, bless these gifts and the gifts of our whole lives that we may serve you and that 
the gentle whisper that we hear from you throughout the week may be something that we share with the world that we may truly love as you love us. Use these gifts, we pray, to your glory and the gifts of our whole lives, we pray. And it is in your name that we pray and give and live. And we all say together, amen. You may be seated. Our scripture today goes way back into the Old Testament, the first, uh, first, first Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 15a. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me. And more also, if I do not make your life like the life of, one of them by this time tomorrow. So he was afraid, and he got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. For I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and he spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after an earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the the sound of a sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, can you think of a time in your life when you were lost? And I mean really, really lost. Today we have GPSs built right into our phones, so it's hard to get lost, but it is possible. The time I remember being completely lost is from my childhood, long before a phone in your pocket could locate a family member in the crowd of a crowded water park. When we were, when I was about fourth grade or so, my friend Chris invited me as his guest to Oceans of Fun for his birthday. Now, I had never been to Oceans of Fun, but I was real excited about spending a hot day in, in, in the water with my best friend. When we got there, we were given that customary lecture, don't, you know, stay together, don't go anywhere without telling his parents, so we got it. We were having a a great time when in mid-afternoon we decided we wanted to float on the Lazy River. You know, uh, Lazy River is one of those things you get a raft and it's got a current and it kind of weighs around, it's got corners and all of those things and lots of people. We checked out our rafts to float on and set sail for our float. The current began to take us along the course, and it was a very relaxing little break from the adventure of water slides and soaking water rides. Just about the time I was enjoying my float, I looked around and 
I could not see Chris anywhere. We must have somehow floated apart with the current and with all of the people crowding us apart and with the corners and everything. And, well, I I began to panic. All I could see were strangers. Chris's mother told us, don't go anywhere by yourself. And here I was, all by myself, at Oceans of Fun. When we got to the entrance of the lazy river, I got out and I began to roam the park, making myself even more lost from my friend. I walked around for some time, panicking, and when finally, to the point of tears, I saw a security guard to whom I told my situation, help, I'm lost from my friend, I can't find anyone, I'm lost forever, I'll become an orphan and estranged from the world forever, you know, kid fears. The guard assured me that we would find uh, my friend and his parents if we did a tad bit more looking together, that's all you could do in those days. After what seemed to be like an eternity, I saw my friend's mom off in the distance, looking worried sick. We ran toward each other. We hugged in relief. The lost had been found. The prodigal had come home. What a relief. I mean, it's, it's hard to be, it is hard to be physically lost in our day of phones in our pockets, but it can happen, and when it does, it's one of the worst experiences that you can feel. And there's another kind of lost that I want to talk about this morning. One that I'm sure many of us have experienced from time to time, or are experiencing today. Getting lost as in losing our way, as in being confused about your life's purpose or direction, or feeling worthless or in despair. Centuries ago in the scripture that we just read, the prophet Elijah seemed to feel this way. In a world of loud and competing voices, he struggled to hear the still, gentle voice of God that would lead him. So in our scripture today, we meet up with the prophet Elijah, who's on the run in fear for his life. And a little bit of background is in order, I think, for us to know with, uh, what, to be on track with what's going on. Elijah was a prophet during the reign of King Ahab, about the 9th century B.C., King Ahab was one of the most evil and immoral kings to rule in Israel. He shacked up with Jezebel and they formed an evil alliance in which they worshipped false gods and persecuted the prophets of God, Yahweh. In the previous chapter, Elijah arranged a showdown between himself and 450 prophets of Baal, the false god that Jezebel and Ahab were worshipping. In the episode, he, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it, it all came to head, and in the episode, he challenged Baal's prophet to summon their god to consume a sacrifice that they had prepared. You know how it turned out. They did so over and over, but nothing happened. Then Elijah summoned, the, uh, then Elijah summoned Yahweh, and the whole sacrifice and the water around it were consumed. King Ahab and Jezebel were incensed. They were not impressed. They they promised at the beginning of our scripture today to kill Elijah if they ever caught up with him. And so Elijah ran for his life. It says in verse 3, he got as far as Beersheba, which scholars tell us is about roughly 100 miles away. He was in fear for his life. He ran far and fast. Scholars tell us then he walked a whole day's walk into the desert, and that's where the despair set in. In verse 4, it says that Elijah gave up. He, he, He sat down under a bush there in the desert, and he asked that God would take his life. Now, now this is not the Elijah that, that we knew from a few chapters before. I mean, that was a confident Elijah who fulfilled his life's purpose who was in the prime of his life, who confronted kings and and the followers of Baal, who, who raised the dead from their graves and even called down lightning from heaven, who won a showdown against 450 prophets of Baal. You see, Elijah literally had the world at his fingertips. He was in the prime of his life. And, and yet one chapter later, it, Elijah seems to have lost his way. He's defeated. He's fearful. He's in despair. So much so that he asked God to end his life right there. 
I know many of us have felt the way, the same way that Elijah did many centuries ago. Feelings of despair and loneliness uh, are on the rise in America specifically. And, and if you haven't struggled with, with this level of despair, I know that all of us have dealt with loneliness or feelings of worthlessness just like Elijah. You know, sometimes we have reasons for these feelings, a loss of job or relationship or health that can make, sometimes make us feel worthless or despairing. Like Elijah, our own fear can eat us alive. But sometimes, as it was for Elijah as well, we can lose our way due to no real good reason at all. Elijah had everything. He was on the top of his game at the prime of his life. He, he literally had God at his fingertips, really, when it just seemed like out of nowhere his life turned on a dime. I think he was looking back and saying, you know, how did I get here? What, how, what led me to here? Why was I, you know, on top of the world and now I'm in the middle of a desert in despair? Like Elijah, sometimes we and those that we love can become someone that we are surprised and shocked that we are. And it scares us because the journey out seems so long and daunting. I would encourage you that if you're feeling this way today, there's hope for you. Reach out for me or those that you love and that you trust to lead you through. And although I'm not a medic mental health professional, I believe that spiritual care combined with competent mental and medical professionals can lead us out of despair and into the abundant life that God wants for you. At his deepest level of despair and at his loneliness, God reached out to Elijah to sustain him, not just once, but twice, with food and drink and the strength to carry on for 40 days and 40 nights, which is the biblical way of saying basically for a long, long time. Like Elijah, many of us, even when we are at the bottom of the barrel, even when we're at our wit's end, can look back and we can see how God has been leading us. Like it was for the Israelites in the wilderness, God provides for us what we need, not always what we want. Uh, and, and God gives us not enough for tomorrow, but just enough for today. You know, whether this be material resources or strength or even information. You see, I've had this conversation with many of you before. I'm so glad that God has all the knowledge and not me. I'm so glad that I don't know my future. If I knew what my future held, I would either be so depressed or I would go so wild I couldn't even function. I believe that God gives us the information that we need just for today. And there's a lot we don't know, and I think, thanks be to God, we don't. Because if we knew what God knew, we couldn't handle it. Thankfully, God holds the future, and we don't. But God does care for us, and he loves us so much that he gives us just what we need, just what we need to know, just what we need to feel, just what we need to experience for that one moment in time. You know, right at the time when we need a friend, a resource, a way out, God provides for each of us what we need right on time. Both for Elijah and for us, God speaks to us uh, in, in a plethora of ways. He asked Elijah in verse 9, what are you doing here? Which he will ask again a second time in the scripture. God cares for what we're going through. Elijah cries out to God, you know, I've been zealous for you and, and the Israelites have ignored you and, and your prophets have been killed and everything's going down and now I'm being pursued, lonely and afraid. So God tells Elijah, we got to fix this. And so he says, prepare for my presence as if speaking to him wasn't enough. So he told Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain that he's about to pass by. Elijah did as he was told. Verse 11, there was a great wind so vicious it split mountains and rocks before him, but God wasn't in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And after that, there was fire, but God was not in the fire. It wasn't in the wind or the earthquake or all these big things like fire that everybody else in the world believed God was found in. All of the loud and booming things. Instead, in what the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible interprets as sheer silence. 
The King James Version calls it a still, small voice, and the New International Version interprets it as a gentle whisper. However, you know, however you've been or however we interpret it today, you know, if you've ever been somewhere that's so quiet it's disturbing, so quiet that you can't take it any longer, I can imagine that is the the sound of silence, a sheer whisper. There's, There's power in silence. It's a weight upon you. And many people who have been in silence for a long time can't take it anymore because we're not used to it. It's just silence can be so heavy and powerful. There's power in silence. And and despite the fact that God can be present in the storms of life, in tornadoes, in earthquakes, in the loud events that happen in our lives, God can and is very much present in the stillness, in the silence, in the pain, in the valleys in the monotony of our daily lives, in the drudgery, in the loneliness. You see, I think that's one way we can interpret silence or the still small voice. It's not in the the grandiose mountains of life, but it's it's in the valleys. It's in the low times. It's in those moments. It's in the monotony of the day-to-day work and errands that God is here ready to speak to us a word of love, sustenance, and hope. You see, the voices that we hear in our loud, in our vo- in, the voices that we hear in our world today are often very loud and disturbing. In the information age in which we live, these sounds can be constant. We hear news reports every day of evils and atrocities that render us speechless, silent. Wars and invasions kill and uproot millions of innocent people because of the disputes of a few. The sounds of violent weather across the world wreak havoc for millions every year. The effects of global climate change are getting closer to home, and and we, we, we scarcely find God in these disasters. Yet the loud clamor does not stop there. The noise is just as loud in our commercial marketplace, where we're told sometimes subtly and sometimes very explicitly that we're not good enough or complete enough or whole enough until we spend more money to make ourselves whole. And then, and then there are these whispers that are real loud from within that confuse us even more. The voice on our other shoulder, you've heard it before, that compares us with others, that, that says we're not good enough or, or worthy enough. You've heard it. I hear it. I know. Despite all this noise and all this clamor in our world, it's no wonder that we often struggle to find the presence of God, to hear his voice that gives us purpose, reason, and hope. And like Elijah, Elijah, you know, with all, and like Elijah, sometimes without, when all, in a world of noise, that can lead us to despair. Although you may not get lost these days with GPS at your side, Elijah reminds us today it is possible to feel lost in the deeper sense of the word. With all the clamor and with all the noise in our lives today, it's easy to become misdirected, misinformed, and unbalanced. But the God who provides for Elijah will provide for each one of us and is providing. And although we often look for God in the loud noises of of this world to provide for us, God often speaks to us in his gentle whisper, in the still in the quieter voices, in the calmer, more reserved folks around us that say, whoa, wait a minute. Not in the drama or the distractions or all or, or our tight schedule. God is found in the still smaller voices. You know, many times I have seen God's, what I call God's fingerprint on my life, it, many years after something happened. I told you about the time when I was sick and I ended up in uh, the heart unit of KU and my nurse was Tony McBroom, who was the youth director at the time. Have you heard of Avondale? I said, not really. I'm just familiar with where the sign is and that was all. And years later, I come here. In ways that we don't fully understand, I believe that God puts his fingerprint on our lives in still, small, very gentle ways that many times we don't realize until years or maybe even decades down the road. God works in large ways, yes, but, but as Elijah saw today, God works in also very small and subtle and still ways to provide for the needs that we have. You know, where, wherever you have become lost or off track or derailed, God is here for you. Today, uh, we often call this sort of being untra- off track, being unbalanced, 
That seems to be the buzzword for today. Several years ago at a pastor's meeting, all of us were given a prayer that we said in unison, and I loved it so much that I saved a copy, and I read it periodically, and I'm going to read an excerpt here, but I'd be glad to print off a copy for you if you'd ever like it. It goes like this. Dear God, hectic, rushed, worried, stressed, cluttered, burdened, lonely, tired, complex. Sound familiar? This is my life, Lord, but this is not your plan for my life. I am pulled in all directions, Lord, lead me in your direction. I am unbalanced, Lord. This is my life, but this is not your plan for my life. Give me harmony, give me peace, give me grace, give me balance. Lord, this is my life, but this is not your plan for my life. This prayer so many times has convicted me and pulled me back to listen to the still, small voice And day by day, when I start to feel myself get distracted or derailed, I think of that prayer. This is my life, but this is not, Lord, this is not your plan for my life. Despite the loud noise in our lives, despite the distractions, despite everyone pulling us in all of these different ways, there is one voice that sustains us and guides us and gives us hope and direction. The voice of God that can be so majestic and powerful and booming and and yet we can find God in these wonderful high mountaintop experiences of our lives and yet a voice of God that is powerful still and precious. Let us stop looking for God in all the noise and the clamor but instead to sit and still in his presence to hear his gentle whisper that will sustain us and guide us, our families, our world, and our church forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield to you. My spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You my heart's desire and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I Give God praise today as we sing our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. Let it, be the, uh, uh, let it be another way that we offer this prayer today. Let's stand together. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free 
Silently now I wait for thee, ready for mud thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear Gladly the warm truth everywhere Open my heart and let me prepare Love with thy children thus to share Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see Open my heart, illumine me Spirit divine. And so now with open hearts, may we be illuminated. May we go forth to share with the world that gentle, loving voice of God that's often found, not in the big ways, but in the gentle whisper. Go share his love with the world. Share his peace that we may share Christ's love for the transformation of the world. Go in Christ's name. God bless you. Amen.